Th thank you very much for organizing this meeting and introducing me. <clears throat> I really uh, appreciate this uh, opportunity to uh, um, not really, well, just, just, you know, we, we learn from, from each other to just uh, um, uh, uh, tell you a little bit about what I have been doing in the, in the lab and then particularly what I've been doing on cassavas because I only just started. So um, I have lots to learn from you guys. Um, I, it's, it's been an honor to be invited to give a talk and also invited to come to Indonesia. This is my first visit. I have been really enjoying thoroughly so far. Everybody's just so friendly and kind. But anyways, yeah, I'm from uh, uh, Liverpool John Moores University. Uh, my talk today is trying to create a cassava early maturity variety by genome editing. Uh, specifically trying to edit out a gene we have been working on in Arabidopsis. Can you play the second slide, please? <clears throat> Is it on the second, second slide? Sorry, can you still hear me? Yes, the second slide is about the Liverpool. Yes, okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. To start with, I'm going to introduce a little bit about uh, uh, Liverpool, the city. I think lots of you already know. Um, so if you look at the, on the map on the left hand side, uh, this is the whole England um, map. So Liverpool is right in the middle on the west side, west coast. Um, it's a little bit north, northwest. Uh, so London is at the bottom right here. So it's about probably about 150 miles from, from um, London we are. So we are on the north. And uh, Liverpool, lots of, lots of you probably know. So this is the whole city uh, view from, from the Mercy Riverside. Uh, so it's, it ha has lots of uh, history. So it's quite modern as well, as you see on the left hand side, this building is really high rise building is so 30 something stories. But then on the right, you see this very kind of a traditional uh, building, building 1700 something. So they have the modern and, um, and, and the old merged really well in Liverpool. And we are right on, on a, it's not really a coast, it's a river, the river running into the sea. And some of uh, you music lovers, you probably know the Beatles. So they are very famous, they're very big in the 1970s. Um, the famous song by John Lennon is called Imagine. I think lots of you probably know, but again, lots of you are probably too young to know. Um, and we're also very famous for footballs. So I know quite lots of football fans. You probably um, know that really, really well. Um, I have talked to a few people, <laughs> they're, they're very big fans for Liverpool football. So Liverpool is really nice city to live really it's very vibrant you have young people you have music you have sports almost going on every single day lots of pubs play live music from famous people and unfamous people people try, try to um, make themselves famous just this is how Beatles started in the 70s you know they were just playing pubs and things but anyway, that's that's uh, that's enough uh, for uh, introduction uh, for Liverpool. So, so the, the reason for me to introduce that is uh, I, I'm, I'm I'm hoping you come to visit um, Britain and come to Liverpool to see me. <laughs> right. OK, so third slide, please. OK, yeah, already. Yeah. OK, so so the talk uh, of my um, uh, my talk today of the, roughly the three parts So the first is I'm going to give you a little bit um, introduction of our research in the model plants called Arabidopsis, Arabidopsis filiana. You can't get away from not knowing Arabidopsis filiana if you're a plant scientist, because uh, this is the model plant everybody uses, just like animal people using mice uh, as their model system. So you work out the singling path with the gene functions in the model plants first, and then you transfer the knowledge you learned to big crops because big crops like cassava is really difficult to transform. The growth season is really long. It's really difficult to work out uh, the, the pathways. But the Arabidopsis is a little, little weed. It grew from seed to seed, only takes about 45 days. 
So that means in a year, you can go through so many seasons, uh, cassava, but you probably can only go through one season a year. Um, so so, so, so we, uh, I have done lots of my research in Arabidopsis thaliana in the model plant. And then I'm gradually moving uh, to bigger, big crops, cassava is one of them. So, so, so the second bit would be uh, talking about uh, our work in uh, cassava is mainly trying to create an early maturity cassava variety by genome editing. And then finally, I'm just going to summarize what I just have told you and uh, what we are doing at the moment and what is the future uh, research uh, of our topics. Okay, next slide, please. Yes. Okay, so so I'm going to give you a bit of a background. So uh, in my title, I said I'm going to edit out a S A ASAL translate uh, tran transfer trans uh, trans uh, uh, ASAL uh, transferase gene. So what what is it? So lots of you probably know in a given plant, it, given a cell, it doesn't matter plant cell or animal cells. Lots of proteins are. Uh, are localized in the membrane. So this so S isolation is one of the mechanisms to target proteins to the membrane for their proper function. So lipid modification, particularly S S isolation, sometimes people call it a pomatilation, is really quite a simple um, um, lipid modification where you can see on this diagram at, at the bottom. Is, is basically, so proteins after they synthesized, they have to go through various modifications before they can become functional. Uh, so for instance, you probably, lots of you know, probably, uh, you, you know, methylation, you know, uh, phosphorylation, like lots of kinases, so they have to go through phosphorylation before they can be functional. Uh, in, in this group of protein I've been working on, is called s isolation. That means after the protein synthesized, uh, they have to be modified by putting on a launching fatty acid. And in this diagram, this launching fatty acid contains 16 carbon. So that's called a pomatic acid. So that's why sometimes acylation is also called a pomatilation, especially in animal research. But now we called, we, we sort of steer away from pomatilation to acylation because it's not just this fatty acid can modify uh, um, your substrate proteins, that's lots of other fatty acids can also go through uh, this modification, but uh, most of the time, probably 80% of the time is the pomti acid. So that means you add in a launching fatty acid contains 16 carbons to the sub substrate protein. Uh, so on the left hand side is a protein which has a cysteine residue. And as you know, on the cysteine, uh, cysteine residue, there's the SH group on there. Uh, and this is the, the pomti acid. Um, so under the, um, the action of this enzyme called a pomital acyl transferase, is, we also call the PET for short. Uh, under the action of a PET, uh, this fatty acid can be connected to the SH group on the cysteine residue of the substrate protein there. So now your protein uh, has a long chain fat acid attached to it. And, and what is uh, interesting and also really important for this modification is um, this modification is reversible, meaning that after your proteins modified by this pomti acid, uh, pom acid uh, and this, 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 uh, this pomti acid can be hydrolyzed off and your protein become free again, so they're not localized in the membrane again. They probably go through going to other. Um, they're going to do other things. So that means sometimes through pomatilation and a depomatilation, your protein can do two different things. Sometimes it depends on they could be disease, they could be drought. So when drought come, you probably your protein be modified, uh, adding a, on a fatty acid. When drought is not there. And this protein is not needed anymore. This new the, the, the fatty acid get hundred off, hydrolyzed off, and the protein can do something else. So this is a really very dynamic dynamic process. So if I show you, uh, can can you see can you see a, a picture drawing on the plasma membrane? 
So if you press a few times and you'll yeah. see, yeah. Okay, so if I show you this in action, so so uh, you saw the uh, the plasma membrane, that's uh, um, the 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 lipid the lipid bilayer. So PET, so pom pomatolar acyl transferase has the four transmembrane region, uh, transmembrane regions. So it's usually sit in the membrane. And your protein after it's being synthesized is in the, in the yellow uh, circle. It's just floating about in it's a cytosolic. Uh, so it's not membrane localized. But once it's needed, and, and the that can be uh, trafficked to the membrane close to the pad. So sorry, can 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 you follow? Yes, yes. Okay. I can follow. Okay, so after that, uh, your protein has a long chain fatty acid attached onto it. So in this way, um, the protein now, instead of being floating about, now it's hanging on a, on a, on a membrane, just like a, you're using a hook, so you're hooking on, onto the membrane. So, but uh, this, this, is the, this process, when it's finished, when, it's, when, when the protein not needed to be in the membrane, and the fatty acid can be hydrolyzed off by PPT, so different enzyme. And now your protein uh, floating about again is so going to do something else. And this process can happen also on Golgi because you can find pet uh, proteins on all endomembrane systems. That means they can be localized in so different pets localized in different regions of the endomembrane. So um, some of them localized in PM, in plants, probably 50% of the, uh, the pets uh, localized in PM, but others also probably one third of them also localized in Golgi and others can be localized in ER. So basically you can find them in, in the whole endo in, in endomembrane system. So the next one I'm showing you just in, it's, it's one of the proteins modified by a pet, which is localized in the Golgi membrane. So it's going through exactly the same thing. So your protein used to be just floating about, but, uh, but the, by the pet, which is localized in the Golgi membrane, can transfer this fatty acid onto your protein and your protein can be trafficked onto the uh, plasma membrane. So in this way, the protein can be trafficked between the Golgi and the PM. This happens quite a lot, especially in animal uh, proteins. Lots of you, if you work in animal system, you probably heard of uh, RAS. RAS is involved in lots of cancer, cancers. So it's uh, lots of study being being published in there. So RAS is uh, constantly trafficked between Golgi and the PM through pomatillation. So this is a really dynamic process, uh, which is uh, um, very, so carry out lots of uh, functions. You can target the protein onto the membrane. The, that's, you can also remove it from the membrane. So your protein can do various things. It depends on what status of your plant or animal cells are under. When they're under stress, they could be pomatillated. When they're not under stress, they're probably just floating about, do something, things very happily. Right. Can I have the next slide, please? Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to give you a little bit of detail about um, protein as ASR transferase or PET. What, what, what is it? I have mentioned that uh, PET is uh, um, a multiple transmembrane protein. So in, in this diagram, you can see uh, that these this four blue cylinders, that's, that's where the transmembrane regions are. So normally PETs have uh, four transmembrane regions. Some, some others, very few of them have a six, but most of them, probably 99% of them, have a four transmembrane regions. The most important region is the so-called DHHC-CRD region, which is the, uh, the region contains lots of uh, cysteine residues, because uh, cysteine residue has the SH group. The SH group can be connected to a fatty acid where the fatty acid can be transferred into the substrate protein the PET modifies. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you, if you press the game, so mm -hmm. I, I have uh, mentioned that there's many PETs uh, mm -hmm. in, a given, in a given organism. So the, here, so Arabidopsis thaliana has a 24, 
And actually, mo one more than human. So humans only have a 23, yeast have a seven. So yeast is another model system. So lots of this pet research or the palm deletion research started in yeast. And then that went on in human and, and then now went on into plants. So there's lots of uh, study, what we refer to or the methodology, we look at it. Usually you look at what, what, uh, what they've done uh, in yeast. And sometimes we look at what they've done in humans because the plants research, I don't know how many of you <laughs> do plant research. Plant research is always lagging behind a little bit compared to humans because uh, there's lots of um, um, investment in human because that's, you know, lots of conditions are related to disease and things. So the government usually heavily fund medical research. So, so when you get lots of money, then your research can get advanced much faster, but the plants are less funded. So usually we probably at least five years, if it's not 10 years behind any more research in a similar uh, topics. So can I have the next slide, please? Yes. Yeah. So, so now just a little, little uh, summary, really. So PET or the protein as ACR transferase, they are, they are enzymes. They function through modifying their substrate proteins by adding a fatty acid onto the protein they modify. Uh, so, so, so this, this, the, the protein they modify could be receptors. We all know receptors are really important for singling pathways in disease resistant, in drought, um, in, in various uh, phys physiological stress and also biological stress. Uh, there are 24 pets in Arabidopsis, but uh, the subject protein the, these 24 pets modify is more than 1,000. As you can see, each pet can modify on average probably more than 50 subject proteins, but these 50 subject proteins are not necessarily or working in the, in the same pathway. They could be working in different pathways. So that's why if you knock out one pet, are you going to have... Uh, 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 various defects. So, so because if these are 50 substrates, they involved in singling pathway, they also involved in uh, growth pathway. If you knock both pathways out, so if you knock this one pet out, that means you're knocking 50 these uh, substrate proteins out. So you're going to have uh, quite severe phenotypes uh, or defects in the in the mutant. And what is also um, known is, so both pets and their, their modified subject proteins, their membrane proteins. Some of you, if you're working on membrane proteins, you probably know they are nightmare to work with. So that's why advances in uh, pomatillation research, doesn't matter in plants or in animals, they are quite slow because just the methods, lots of methods not really suitable to study membrane proteins. Can I have the next slides, please? Yes. Okay. Okay, right. Okay, so that's the background. So now I'm going to share with you some of my research in the model plant, Arabidopsis thaliana. Next slide, please. Yeah. Okay, so I mentioned that in Arabidopsis, there are 24 uh, pet genes in them. So this is a phylogenetic tree. Can you see the phylogenetic yeah. tree? Yeah. yeah. Can, you, can you click? Mm, okay, yes. <laughs> if you click. So the first um, studied pet is called a pet 24. So these are 24 pets in Arabidopsis. They are named from number one to number 24. So you can see um, 80 pet 24. So 80 stands, on, stands for uh, Arabidopsis thaliana. So, mm. so the first one is 80 pet 24. That was published uh, in 2005, it was, was quite strange. This guy actually knew that's when I was working in Bristol University, my first postdoc position. And this is one of the, our students um, done, done this research there. But this public publication, they, they probably done 20 years research be, before they published on this big paper on plant cell. But after that, nothing being done. So I changed my job from Bristol University to Bath University doing it on a different project. Because when I was in Bristol University, I wasn't working on population, I was, I was working on fish oil. 
engineer a plant to produce fish oil. So that was on a different project. But when I was working in Bath, my project changed because that's my second postdoc. So when you do postdoc position, uh, you don't really have your own project. You, you're, you're given a project to work on. So in this project, um, we found out, I actually just stumbled into this field uh, where I was working on G protein singling. So I was using G protein, one of this, one of the um, subunit called the G, G alpha subunit. I made a yeast to hybrid library. So I use uh, I use G protein alpha subunit as a bait, and I pull out lots of interacting proteins. One of them is pectin. Can you click, please? Yes. Yeah. So one of the interacting protein of G protein is uh, uh, pectin. So at the time, nobody knows what it is, and we even had different name. So I had a different name. I called it DHHC. Um, but only change the name later on. Uh, and this is one of the interacting proteins. Um, but uh, later on, so we went on to, to look at it. We thought this, this the family protein is hardly being started. And the person, the PhD student who did the PET 24 before he moved on to do something else. So he's not working on it. And then nobody worked on it in the whole world, I thought. Okay, then. so I'm going to look at look at what they're doing. Uh, these uh, family proteins. Can you click again, please? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the first one we work on is Pac-10, and and one of my PhD students started to screen all the mutants of the other the other 22 pet uh, to see if what what the other pets do. So the second one she she identified is called a pet. Uh, 14. So when you knock out, so on the left hand side the, in the picture is the wild type, looks really nice and healthy. But when you knock out pet 14, you can see the plant are much smaller, but it's still bigger than pet 10 mutant. Um, but it's also mature much early. So I, I'm going to tell you a little bit more later on. Can you click again, please? And, and the, another one she, she identified is called PET15. And PET15, if you knock it out, the seed, the seeds just does not germinate at all. And so she looked into more details and then she published papers um, on this one as well. Can you click again, please? Mm -hmm. yeah. So the next one uh, she, she uh, isolated is called uh, PET21. But 21, when you knocked out, I'm not showing the plants, but I'm showing uh, when the, 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 um, this is the pollen, pollen um, forming process. Uh, we showed that. So the, the reason we show this is because of pet 21, when you knock knocked it out, um, the plants do not produce seeds at all. Uh, what we found out later on is um, pet 21 is related to meiosis, where as you know, when during cell division, uh, also in, in reproduction, so they have to go through meiosis and then uh, mitosis. So both systems gone pretty wrong. So that's why they don't produce in proper seeds. So they don't they go completely sterile. But uh, anyway, that, that's other talks on maybe on a different day, but today I'm going to concentrate on uh, AT PET. 14, because this is the one we take forward in uh, cassava. Okay, can I have the next slide, please? Yeah. So, because uh, we, we, we analyze a bit further our PET 14 uh, mutant, and it shows early mat maturity, probably also involved in disease resistant. Can I have the next slide, please? Yes. So, the mutant, lots of you probably, work, if you're working on uh, Arabidopsis, you probably, the first thing you want to work out the function of the gene, you're going to see if this gene has a knockout line. So we call the TDA uh, knockout line, no, knockout line, that means you have a big chunk of the DNA inserted in somewhere in the gene, genome so that you, this whole gene gets disrupted. Um, so the, the gene uh, is not functional. So in this case, the PET14, uh, gene. So this is a diagram to show the gene, um, the whole structure. So the black box is the exons, the lines are introns, 
and you also have the empty boxes, you also have the five uh, untranslated region, you also have the three untranslated region on the right. So we identify this uh, mutant by identifying the TD insertion site. So this line, so this, this the, the uh, triangle box that shows where the TDA is being inserted. The TDA is uh, pretty big, it's about 4,000 uh, KB. So you can imagine if your gene have this big chunk of DNA inserted into the first exon not long after ATG, the, uh, the, uh, the, the translation initiation in in called on, you can see the whole gene probably get knocked out. This is exactly what happened. So, so the, the student did uh, um, some RT-PCR to see if pet gene is still there. So the, the top, uh, can, can I click? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can see the, the first gel file, you can see mm -hmm. the wild type on, on the left hand side, you see a nice band. So that shows the PET14 is there. But on, on the right hand side, PET14 mutant, you can see the PET14 gene is got knocked out. It's not there uh, anymore. So so, 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 so the, the second one shows you exactly the same thing, but they're just using two different primer pairs. Um, the primers are showed on the diagram in A. So the, the first gel is used, we used uh, the uh, primer just based on ATG and another primer just downstream of the uh, TD insertion site called the RP. You have a smaller product. And the second gel, uh, image is we amplify the whole CDS. So from the beginning to the end, so from ATG to TG, you can see there's no transcript there at all. The bottom gel is just shows you, um, is, is a housekeeping gene just shows you, is, is, so, the, the, so the, the genes are not there, it's not because you, you didn't put any, uh, any RNA in it, it's just because the gene was knocked out because the housekeeping gene uh, doesn't matter if in the wild type or in the mutant, they show exactly the same level. So housekeeping genes, and that's good internal controls. You, you use them because they're not affected by anything, uh, the ex expression level. Can you click again, please? Yes. Yeah. So so the, the as to the phenotype I showed you earlier, so if you look at further, so you, on the wild type uh, on the left hand side, mm -hmm and the mutant on the right hand side and these are four week old plants but if it's a six week plant old plants you can see the wild type plants still grow really well still green but the mutant plants already become yellow so the seeds already uh, become yellow you can collect the seeds after six weeks you can see um so can you click again please yeah so you can see um, the PET14 mutant mature much earlier. So it's mature almost two weeks earlier than, than, the, um, than the mutant. So it's nearly like 40%. So that's, uh, um, so not, can click, can you, can you mm -hmm. click again? Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, so what we look at, so we try to find out what is the reason for this early mature, mature, maturity or early senescence. So what we found is, if you look at the leaves very carefully, and half of the leaf, can you click again? Can mm -hmm. you see the picture? Yeah. yeah. Uh, half of the leaf, you can see they're not completely yellow. So in a normal maturity, your whole leaf become yellow. But if you look at these leaves, on the left hand, hand side of this leaf, still green, but on the right hand side is yellow. It so almost looks like the, this plant is being diseased. Right, so the disease only affecting part of the, the leaf where it's become yellow by the other half not infected and it's still green. So that's why we think maybe it's involved in disease resistance, something to do with, with that. So, so all, we, we, all, we all know that if it's uh, um, involved in disease resistant, it's got to be the SA sinking pathway is not quite right. So what we look at it is we look at the, the two genes involved in SA singling pathway. Um, can you click? Yeah. Yeah, so on the left hand side, the gene, the ICS gene is involved in SA synthesis. Uh, you can see in the, in the wild type, 
the uh, ICS1 gene after 28 days, in the 28 day old plants, the expression level increased compared to seven days, but are still much lower compared to the mutant. We actually have the two mutant lines, we call the pent 14 one and pent 14 two So you can see the expression level of SA synthesis genes are uh, highly e uh, elevated. And, and we also look at the NPR gene, which is as a singling gene, it's a receptor gene. And we, we look at that, it's exactly the same thing. So their expression level also increased compared to the wild type, you know, 28 day old siblings. Can you click again, please? Yeah. yeah. And the next thing is we also did some uh, complementation because we know NPR gene, when you knock out, uh, the SA level is reduced and it's, it's uh, slow. So, so the mutant become um, a state green for quite a long time. That means that they uh, don't mature as fast as the wild type. So they stay green much longer. So we did a double, uh, double mutant. So we, that means we cross NPR1 mutant and the PET14 mutant. What we found is the PET14 now, uh, the, you know, double mutant, um, the, the maturity got extended uh, almost like uh, the NPR1 mutant. So that convinced us the PET14 become mature. Is it involved? It, the reason behind it maybe is because of the SA synthesis path, pathway and also the SA singling pathway got disrupted. So that's why we think maybe PET14, when you knocked it out, this PET14 probably also uh, disease resistant. So, oh, I think, didn't come in. Yeah. Can, can you click, please? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so now we're thinking, okay, then we almost have the perfect combination. So you have a Arabidopsis mutant, a, a mature early by 40%. Is it also probably disease resistant? So we possibly, if we could knock out the homologous gene from other crops, they probably become um, mature early. They also disease resistant. So this is the perfect uh, combination. So in back back in two thousand nineteen, um, Sonny and I talking. Sonny did his PhD in Bath University when I did my second postdoc. So we know each other pretty well. I know he worked on cassava at the time, but I wasn't. <laughs> so, so after he came back to um, Indonesia and I had some funding, I can apply some, some funding, the so-called GCRF, you probably heard of it, called a Global Challenge uh, Research Fund. And uh, that's really trying to help um, uh, Africa and East Asia, try to help them to develop uh, different varieties to increase food security. So, so we, we get talking and I apply for this grant and we are su successful. We got a fellowship to invite him over. But of course, COVID came, he didn't, came, didn't come. I also got some funding to come to visit Indonesia in 2020. I couldn't make, make it. I just started booking my flight ticket and then, <clears throat> and then pandemic came. So, so we didn't, didn't go ahead. But then, but we just did a, we did a work separately. He did some work here. I did some work in, in Liverpool. So, so we think that would be good to, uh, to, to make a cassava more uh, mature a bit early and probably also disease resistant because cassava is a stable food crop uh, in, in Africa and in many regions of uh, Asia. Uh, it's mainly for the starchy storage route. I don't have to tell you because you all know it. Um, that is a feed more than 800 million people. But there's the problems with the cassava. Um, one of the problem is it has a, can, can, can you click? Are we on the cassava slide? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, cassava has a very long growth season. That's what Sonny told me. Uh, it takes 12 months to mature. That means that you, from you, plant your cassava to you harvest the root, it takes a 12 months. Uh, cassava also has another problem called post-harvest physiological uh, deterioration or PPD. That's what Sonny worked on 
for his PhD when he was in Bath. And we also have collaboration working on that as well, but I'm not going to show you the what we did in there. That could be another talk. And cassava also suffer from various disease and that can cause probably 60% loss for uh, cassava yield. And also cassava are really big plants. So that means you use a big area to grow cassava. So that's various problems with, with that's, that's other problem, problems as well. But um, uh, so, so therefore, if we could create a cassava variety, which is mature early, the disease resistant, they're smaller, that means they use less land, and they could also have a delayed PPD, that'd be ideal. So what I'm going to tell you about, can you click? Yeah. There is just trying to see, could we create a early maturity uh, variety by, so by that time, now we all, we all know CRISPRs before. So Sonny did some work trying to knock out genes to delay PPD by I and I. Uh, but that's only knocked down the gene expression level by not knocking out. So at the moment, we, uh, we, we made CRISPR vectors to try to knock out the gene completely so that we try to have a variety to not suffer from PPD at all. Um, but what I'm going to tell you is the uh, early variety. As I showed you before, can you click? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as I showed you earlier, the slide, just to give you a reminder. So if you know how to pet 14 from Arabidopsis and Arabidopsis plants become mature much earlier compared to the wild type, it's actually by 40%. That means if the homologous gene in cassava, you knocked it out, if it's a 40% early mature, that means you probably came from plants to harvest your cassava, it probably takes eight months rather than 12 months. So that would be, you know, that, that would, would be almost like you have two seasons of harvest in a year. So that obviously you can increase the yield as well. Um, so can you click please? Yeah. And of course I also showed you uh, knocking out the pad 14 can also be pos possible, could be you create a disease resistant uh, plant. So, so if you do this in cassava, you might have a disease resistant cassava because of a disease, you lose 60% and now you have your 60% yield increase because it's more disease resistant. Can you click please? So, so therefore uh, we could probably to create an early maturity and also disease resistant cassava. It could be possible. So this is what we are, this is the theory behind it. So this is what we're trying to do. Can you click? Yes. Okay. So the first thing we have to know, does cassava have Arabidopsis PET14 homologous genes? That means, so, okay then, so you think you can knock this out, but if cassava does not have this gene, you should not be able to knock out this gene, aren't you? So the first thing you have to look, does cassava have this homologous gene um, in them, in their genome? So what we did is we used, can you click? Mm -hmm. yeah. So what we did is we used uh, the Arabidopsis, Arabidopsis PET14 sequence. We blast uh, cassava genome because the cassava just been uh, the genome just been sequenced in 2016 or 17. So quite recently. So when we use the PET14 as a query to blast the genome of cassava, what we found is we found that there are 32 cassava PET14 genes. We named them as ME PET, PET PETs from one to 30, 32. And what is also uh, good is we found four, four of them very close, cl so their, their sequence has share high similarity to Arabidopsis PET14. So just from the bioinformatics data, we can see, so, so the ones shaded in kind of yellow pinkish, um, those are the genes uh, similar to Arabidopsis PET14. And when we compare them, you can see that the top four of them, we name them as PET ME, PET 14, one, two, three, and four. 
and the similarity between their sequences to Arabidopsis PET-14 sequences is ranging from 71% to 84%. So, so the so the student started to look at it, the first one, so the most um, uh, similar one, so we call the PET-14 one, the one share 84% similarity to ET PET-14. Uh, can you click the next yeah. slide, please? Yeah. So this is just to give you uh, more insight of the, the sequence. Uh, as I say, uh, as I told you very early on, all the pads have uh, um, transmit, four transmembrane regions. The most important area is the so-called DHHC CRD region. This is the, the enzyme activity re, uh, region, if you like. So all the Cs, the cysteine residues, are shaded as yellow, and the DHHC is shaded as a blue, so in a blue box. So all the PET-14, there's four of the PET-14 in cassava, they have the conserved, so-called conserved DHHC CRD regions, which is a very good news. And we also um, look at their three-dimensional structure. As you can see, um, there are, so they're sitting in the membrane. So all the PET-14s are sitting in the membrane uh, and they have these four transmembrane regions which is quite typical for other pets found in animals and also in plants and in yeast. And importantly, it also have the DHHC CRD regions. Uh, so this is the enzyme center. So we, we have done all this uh, analysis that shows it's, uh, they are very typical pets. Most likely they will have pet activities. But uh, the next, so from the sequence of prediction, that's what we can tell but we don't know until we carry out experiments. So this is what, what he did. So one of my PhD students did. So he carried out functional complementations in yeast and in Arabidopsis to confirm ME PET-14-1 is a functional PET. It's also functional PET-14. Can you click the next slide, please? Yeah. So the first experiments they did is to try to see if ME PET-14-1 can complement or rescue the yeast PET mutant ACAR-1. So, so in yeast, uh, as I showed you early on, there are seven PET genes. Um, every PET gene, if you knock out, it has a, a different phenotype. For ACAR-1, this is the one of the most studied one. If you knock that gene out from yeast, uh, the yeast cells don't grow very well. So as you can see from the picture here, uh, the top one is wild type. So wild type, they grew really well at 37 degrees, but ACAR1, so if you knock out this pet, mute, uh, pet gene, the, uh, the, the mutant ACAR1 does not grow that well. Uh, so you see different dots, there's a different dilution different dilution ones. So the first one not diluted, the second one is 1 to 10, 1 to 20, 1 to 40, 1 to 60. So this is the different dilution. It's a very, very typical method you would use uh, in a yeast of two hybrid assays or complementation assays, as you or you, you all know that. So the first thing is if we want, we want to know if ME PET14 is a function or not, or not we transformed uh, uh, ME PET14 1 into ACAR1 mutant, and we want to see if ME PET141 is functional. If it's a functional, that should rescue. That means the growth should be better than ACAR1. So that's exactly what happens. So if you put ME41 into ACAR1 mutant, and now the, the yeast cells can grow as well as the wild type. However, if you put the mutant version, because as I showed you, uh, as I mentioned to you before, all the pads, they have an enzyme activity center in the DHHC CRD domain. So if you knock out the C, you change the C cysteine residue to a serine residue, so the, the enzyme won't be functional. 
and now exactly that's what it what it is. So you transform this mutant version of uh, PET14, which does not have the enzyme activity, into ACAR1 mutant, and now you grow that at 37 degrees. It does not grow very well, just like an ACAR1 mutant. Um, it happens, so if you put them in 24 degrees, they all grew a little bit better, but you can still see the difference between the mutant and also PET14 mutant complemented uh, cells. So they don't grow that well. So from here, we can conclude uh, ME PET14-1 can rescue ACAR1 mutant, so it's a PET mutant. And, and but the mutant version of a PET 14 one, which, which does not have the function of a PET enzyme activity, that does not rescue. So therefore, PET 14 is a functional PET, and the, the PET 14 activity site is in the DHHC domain, which is uh, um, similar to other functional PETs. And the next thing we want to know, okay, so your PET 14 has uh, a function for PET, but is it a functional PET14? So to do that, we have transformed PET14 for, uh, for isolated from uh, uh, cassava into uh, Arabidopsis PET14 knockout mutant, which we have. Can we have the next slide, please? Yeah. So this is what happened. So the wild type uh, there's four week plus the wild type uh, grew really well and the mutant in Arabidopsis does not grow that well so this ATAR, AT PET14 mutant doesn't grow that well but if you put um, the uh, cassava PET14 transform that into uh, AT PET14 mutant and you can see the plant grows just as well as the wild type However, if you put the mutated version of ME PET14, the cassava PET14, into the mutant of Arabidopsis PET14, it does not rescue. So just similar to what we saw in yeast, because in yeast, any PET, you can do that assay. But here is a spe specifically say your PET14 isolated from cassava is a PET14 functional gene because it can rescue PET14 uh, mutant from Arabidopsis. And this is six week old plants. You can see that the, the, the order is exactly the same as four week old plants. You can see the, um, the, the mutant mature much early um, and, and, and uh, um, and if you put the functional uh, PET40 in, it just it delayed maturity, just like the wild type. But if you put the mutant PET14 from cassava in, it's just similar to the wild type, uh, to, to the mutant. So from here, we can conclude that ME PET14 can rescue um, the Arabidopsis PET14 mutant. And this relies on the uh, the enzyme activity center in the DHHC because it, that does not uh, does not does not rescue. So PET14 is a functional uh, it's a functional PET14. Uh, so that's that's just our conclusion. So now we have two lines of uh, of uh, of conclusion because because uh, you have to confirm all of your research first before you move on to a big crop because. Every, Cassava can take you years before you have this knowledge. If you move on to cassava, you can waste the years of your effort. So now we are confident um, to carry out the next step, which is seeing cassava, because we know the PET14 from cassava is a functional PET14 gene. That means if you knock out this gene from cassava, you can have an early maturity uh, cassava. Can we have the next slide, please? Thanks. Yeah, so this is what, what we did. So, so what, what we did is we created a CRISPR-Cas9 vector. Uh, what we did differently from other people is, so we, what we did, so, so there's, there's, there's lots of existing uh, CRISPR-Cas9 um, 
vectors uh, about, but they only use Cas9. It's like the most of the Cas9 they use is uh, Mimilia codon optimized. Uh, but what we did is that we replaced the original uh, CRISPR vector with a cassava codon optimized Cas9. So, so you can see the uh, the ME Cas9 is replacing. So you, it's in there at the bottom in the middle. So in this vector, we also what we put in is we put in two. Uh, SDIA expression cassette. So EC stands for expression cassette. By so we are connected to them to each other, so giving us more chance to knock out a gene. Because uh, although this is uh, the CRISPR is a quite efficient knockout gene, but in reality, it's not not so. So it really depends on how you design your uh, SDINA. So where you're going to decide des design that. So lots of people just use one SDINA cassette, but if you put one, if that one doesn't work, and your time is just wasted. So we designed the seven SDINAs. We did a different combination between two SDINAs. We put them into one cassette. Uh, you can see in each of the cassettes, the green cassette there, uh, so you have a different promoter. So this is the uh, U, U629 promoter uh, drive the, the first target or the first SDINA to express. And we have the, the blue box, we have another SDINA cassette where your, S, uh, your SDINA is driven by uh, another uh, promoter is the U3 promoter. So, so, so this is the diagram. So we have to confirm if the cloning is successful or not. So this is uh, what what we did. Um, so from one to three, so we put the two dark targets in. So number five and number three, that's the uh, two of the SG INAs, and we combine them. So say if I say EC1 is five and EC2 is a three. And here, one to, one to three, and two to two plus three, they're they the same thing. So what we confirmed is we use PCR trying to amplify the whole region between uh, SPL2 and SR, SPR. Can you see the two primers? Yeah. Yeah. So you can amplify the whole cassette. The whole cassette would be about one KB. So each cassette is about 500 BP. So, so you can amplify the whole cassette out, the whole two cassettes out. So it's, it's about one KB. And you can also uh, amplify uh, separately each of the cassettes. So the first band in number one, that shows you the first cassette. So you use SP, uh, you use the, uh, the, the SDIA specific primer uh, with the SPR primer. And, and the, the Second one is you use the you use the uh, primer based on ST two the target the EC two there with SPR primer so you can see uh, the size difference but that's mainly confirming both of your cassettes there both of your um, STIA expressing cassettes also there and we also sequenced it and that's all conf confirmed they they all there. So, so this is one of my PhD student did. He only started about a year ago. He has made quite lots of uh, uh, progress. So, so this project is ongoing. So the project student, uh, the PhD student usually takes about three years to complete. So, so at the moment, so we, we have made the construct without the functional test. So the next thing uh, will be trying to transform um, cassava to create uh, PET-14 knockout plants. So this, this is ongoing. This is also our collaboration with the brain uh, here uh, because cassava uh, in UK, we don't, we don't grow cassava at all. It's a tropical plant. It doesn't grow in, in the UK at all. Uh, so it'd be quite difficult to grow them there. But we can do the tissue culture and the transformation, but uh, the field trials are got to be in Indonesia somewhere here. 
But okay, so with that, I'm going to summarize. I went on a bit too long, and we had <laughs> mistakes as well. So I have, uh, hopefully, I have convinced you um, that protein as a as or pump tillation, they play very important roles in growth development, reproduction, drought, and disease resistant. And we, I, we identified four putative uh, ME14, uh, MEPET14 genes from uh, a cassava genome. There are 32 of, of them all together, but we only look at the four of them the, from the PET14 pet, uh, pet similar genes. Uh, we have done functional test for 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 one of the PET14 genes because that's share the highest similarity to PET14 in Arabidopsis. We have done the functional test in in yeast and also in Arabidopsis. Uh, we also made the CRISPR Cas9 constructs. Now they're ready. They're in agrobacteria cells. They're ready to uh, transform. Right, with that, I would like to thank various people. So I have my past PhD student when I was in Bath. Now she completed, now she's working in China Acad Academy of, uh, uh, of Science. She's based in Shanghai. I met her early this year. Um, I also have two current PhD students. One is uh, Carl, uh, who created all these CRISPR uh, vectors. Uh, the other one is a Su. I think I have an arrow pointing to them. I also have lots of uh, um, collaborators, obviously, and uh, I have funding. I also thank Brain for the fellowship to fund my trip this time. So this is the the two students. Can you see the two arrows? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's Carl from the left. So he yeah. made the constructs. So she started about uh, three years ago. She's nearly finishing. She's a very good molecular biologist. Uh, she cloned genes. Make, make all sorts of things. She's very good. Uh, they both are pretty good, really. And, and uh, also, I would really like to thank my hosts. Um, so that's uh, Thony. I know him for a long time. Uh, and uh, um, uh, thank uh, Dr. Nero. And, and also thank Agus has been looking after me ever since I, I arrived on the 29th of July. <laughs> <laughs> uh, show me all sort of food and then places. I really appreciate yeah. that. Um, and this is the last announcement. So my lab welcome PhD students. So if you have a good student, they want to do a PhD oh. in my lab, uh, they are very welcome. We have various um, studentships. I just put a studentship in uh, before I came. Uh, we have various PhD studentships. Um, and I also welcome visiting researchers. So my labs are open to visiting researchers. I had three so far. So you can come for um, three months to a year, one month, two years. I had one stayed longest is one and a half years. Um, so, so, so you're welcome to spend some time in the lab learning CRISPR construction or whatever. Um, you, you, can, you can just come come with that. So this is my uh, my email address if we want to uh, contact yeah. me. Well, thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry about <laughs> the case. Uh, if you have questions, um, ask away. Okay. So thank you, Dr. C, for the fruitful uh, presentation. And now we open for um, discussion. So first, I will stop share to check the chat box if whether there is a questions so i open uh the question. chat yeah oh, okay let's see or is there any participants who wants to um ask okay apa rigno so please uh mas rigno ask the question to uh, dr c please. okay uh, yeah uh, thank you Thank you for the opportunity to uh, for question. For my first question is, uh, you saw that PET14 has uh, several homolog in uh, cassava. cassava. At yeah. least four. Uh, you check 14 does one. It has function uh, that can restore the mutant Arabidopsis. How about the others? I mean. 14 does two, three, and three, at least three, I, I, I show that. 
Yeah. Then okay. the second question is, uh, if you target 40-1 using CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing, it uh, has possibility to target the others 14 uh, pet 14s. How 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 you avoid that uh, off target uh, off target of 14 that's three two or the others and uh, the third question is if you, you transform the construct using agrobacterium it possibly that the crispr cas9 also inserted in the genome how 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 you eliminate because we know that cassava is uh, difficult to uh, make make a seed then for mm -hmm. how segregation like yeah. that i think that that is my question uh, thank you for your answer Thank, thank you very much. That's all very good questions and very difficult con <laughs> questions. <laughs> okay, so the first question is, there are three others we haven't looked at it, three other PET 14s we haven't looked at it. But um, we actually have, so the student, this is ongoing, I haven't shown you the data. So the student cloned all the other three genes and he's doing functional tests in yeast and in Arabidopsis, just like what he did in PET 14-1. So that's, that's ongoing, so he's, he's been doing that. Um, so hopefully they would be all, all PET 14s. And the second question is, so it looks like my CRISPR designed just knocking out PET 14-1. What happens if the other three PET 14s still functional if I, if I just knock out one? So that means probably I haven't done anything. So we have thought about that. So what we did, so we designed seven guide RNAs. The seven guide RNAs, they designed in a way that they can knock out all four, four PET 14s, not just PET 14-1. So, so for, for CRISPR vectors, which is quite powerful because you're, um, you're using golden gate. So you can ligate in as many expressing cassettes as you want. So people like it up to eight cassette before. So you can all you you can you you can knock out multiple genes in the same cassette in, in the same vector. Does that make sense? Yes. So this is what we did because if you look at my uh, my um, CRISPR Cas9 uh, vector with a cassette gene. So in each cassette I have a four targets. So I have a two, I have a, no, in each cassette I have a two targets. So, so I have um, uh, different combinations of sgRNA. So one of them could be targeting PET-41, the other one could be targeting PET-14-2. And because they share a very high homologous, so one of the, for one of the sgRNA that can knock out all four together because that's the region we designed. Did that answer your question? Yes, yes. Yeah. The third question is a very hard one. I don't have an answer. <laughs> oh, yeah, because <laughs> yeah, so, now I think that's, that's in other systems de developed that um, after you after you put in, because basically there's still, there's still genetic transformation, isn't it? You use, uh, you use agrobacteria you still put in the TDA region in it with the Cas9 in it. So you don't know, Cas9 is sometimes very active. They're not just cutting your gene, they're probably cutting other genes. If you leave Cas9 in the genome, it probably started to do funny things. We don't know. So, so ideally, after it's finished, you want the Cas9 gets blasted out. So I think this is the technology there, still not very mature. So people say it doesn't really matter, leave Cas9 in it. And other people say you got to get rid of it. So I think with all sort of research, um, that's 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 never been a perfect solution for everything. That's always a ongoing process of we learning, we improving. So if you if you know how to do it, and I tell me, and then we do it together. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Um, okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Master Ikno. Let's see, we have uh, three questions uh, in the chat box. Uh, they are in Indonesia. 
no, no. The first word is for, from Nufianto Giar Panjang. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, how? Okay. So, how is the effect of the editing the PET4 gene uh, related to the starch biosynthesis? How is the effect of uh, PET4 gene? Yeah. This is the thing I don't know okay. because we haven't got um, we haven't got to cassava PET14 edited edited mm -hmm. plants yet. So mm -hmm. I think these are all the phenot phenotypes that we have to analyze when we have mm -hmm. the, the plants. So it'd be all sort of things that we have to analyze to see you knock out PET14, does it have a negative effect? For for instance, yeah. you're talking about starch, protein, you know, other things. So so that's this is um, this is the thing we don't know. I mean, in Arabidopsis, Arabidopsis don't really have lots of starch in it. We didn't really look at starch. Even you look at starch, Arabidopsis is different. They don't have a storage yeah, room. They don't have, yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. So, uh, yeah. so the second one. Second one is about the materials for the gene editing. Maybe and it's for genetic transformation. The of interest has no available genomes. That's hard. Yeah. That's that's yeah. That's hard. Um, and you you almost like if you don't if, if the genome not being sequenced, you work in the dark, mm. on you. Yeah. So you don't really know. So you can if you know the gene sequence, you can still design your sgRNA. You can still design your target. But what you don't know is what is the off target, because mm. for for the genome, if you know the whole genome sequence, you can blast that bit of the the S, the guard RNA you desired to the whole genome, you know where the off target is. But now you don't know it because you don't have the whole genome sequence. You can still design if you know your gene, because it's basically if you use the CRISPR-Cas9 system, you're looking at the PAM sequence, the mm -hmm. AGG, right? So yeah. you can design anything, um, tiny base pair away from AGG. This is your, your guard RNA. But what you don't know is what is the off target. So that's quite that's quite difficult. Is it durable? But uh, but uh, it's it's hard. Is there another question? Uh, I think the the last one is uh, for the cassava materials for genetic transformation. Uh, what is the what types of cassava materials for the, the gene editing for transforming the gene? The construct, and, and yeah, yeah. The, the construct or the cassava material? The cassava materials. The cassava, I, I think it's a standard, uh, it's the standard variety all cassava researchers use. So we have it in brain here. So they have the colors. So um, so they, they're, going, they're going to do that. Um, oh. So this is a standard material for, yeah. for all the re research. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, because cassava is quite difficult to transform, actually. Yeah. Okay. Are okay. there any other questions or two new messages? <laughs> Will it work if the similar plants in the same genus? Same genus. Uh, uh, what, what, what do you mean? What, what will work? I mean, my construct? Or? Yeah, I think we need to blast the, the genome information from one genus to another genus, like what you have already done with the Arabidopsis path 14 to the... Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Any, any plant, I think any plant they probably will yeah. have. If the they have similarity, molecule. then it might be worse. <laughs> It, it, yeah. is, it is, definitely, yeah. yes. That's okay. the whole point we, we, we did our work in the model plants. Mm. So, so okay. all high plants should have homologous genes yeah. and they should have the similar functions. So another question, how big do you estimate yeah. the deviation will be? What, what do you mean deviation? What deviation? You, you mean standard deviation? <laughs> <laughs> or, or is it statistical yeah. deviation or what, what kind of deviation? Um, maybe uh, Dylan, the, the question, uh, the the participant could uh, ask you uh, through your emails. Uh, yeah, see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Just email, yeah. email me, or you can just yeah. come to find me. I'm based yeah. in Geno genome building, so yeah, yeah. You can come yeah. to, to find me. You, if you yeah. want to have a face-to-face -face chat, yeah. 
a meeting, I'm, I'm very happy to do so. We can talk about your project to see is there anything we overlap or anything, um, you know, I, I can I can advise on. So I'm happy to do that. And uh, one question uh, about the presentation, the PowerPoint that you share with me. Yeah. Is it possible to share with the other participants or do you want to uh, modify the slides first? I think probably better not to share because a lot okay. of updates are not published. <laughs> okay, okay. So, uh, uh, so I will make sure that I will delete your PowerPoint yeah. uh, in my uh, computer. I mean, for uh, all the Aerodopsis, they are fine. They can okay. share because, but uh, the uh, Cassava data we haven't published okay. anything yet. So um, I'd probably be okay, but I would probably prefer share the Aerodopsis Aer bit. Let me, yeah, probably do that. Probably, yeah, probably do that then. Let me, yeah. let me try to modify yes. and then I'll yes. send it to you and then you can yes. share with, with others. Mm -hmm. Because if you delete everything, it doesn't make sense then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. C, for the sharing your uh, recent works about the uh, Kasafa and Arabidopsis.